Oh, right. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Aurel. I'm going to be the moderator for this, this session and, and the next two talks. Um, I hope you're all back from lunch and uh, you had a good break and you can focus on the talks that are going to be today in the afternoon. Those of you who are still having lunch, bon appetit. And um, so let me introduce our next speaker. She is Alishka Grapova, and I'm really happy to introduce her. She's uh, doing wonderful stuff, which uh, I think should be really part of this, uh, this session. And um, she's an assistant professor at the Kavli Institute of Nanoscience at Delft University of Technology. But she, is also, she also did her undergrad at our, at our university, at the Czech Technical University. So um, it is really my great pleasure to have her here. And uh, please, the floor is yours. And uh, please, the audience, put all your questions in the Q&A. We're going to have them asked from Arishka at the end of the talk. So. Thank you, Aurel, so much for the kind introduction. Let me share my slides. Again, thank you so much for having me. I am super excited that this event exists. And yeah, we were just talking about how many people from Central and Eastern Europe are presenting here that I didn't even know come from the same group of countries as I do. So I am really thrilled to contribute. Uh, today, I was thinking I'm going to tell you about the engineering the entanglement of topological modes. I am going to explain in a second, in a more broader terms, what I mean by that. This is a very cool uh, new research direction that we are opening up in my group at uh, Delft University of Technology. And I specifically want to highlight my PhD student, Guli Xinxin, who is the one leading this research in my group. So maybe to start a little bit more broadly, what we are studying at QMAI are basically overlaps of three fields that has developed until recently largely independently. One is quantum computing, which is the background I personally come from, as Aurel mentioned, through my undergrad in Prague. Uh, the second one is artificial intelligence, and the third one is topology and condensed matter. Artificial intelligence has emerged recently as something that people have been using across different fields for more efficient data processing, and physics was one of those useful objectives as well. Even though it's not something that I want to talk too much about today, I still wanted to use to motivate things, because somehow this abstract condensed matter, quantum computing, can be really interestingly connected through this AI bridge. So this is something that we've been thinking about a lot. You have uh, different applications like using neural networks as a trial wave functions for your variational problems or using uh, measurement data to feed into machine learning models to discover new phases of matters or, or learn your Hamiltonian. Another, another useful contribution of AI to the other side, to the more practical quantum computing aspects, was where things like uh, parameter estimation for quantum devices, or just direct on-chip quantum control of those devices, or just optimization of your, of your quantum algorithm, be it uh, variational NISC quantum algorithms or the quantum error correction and things like that. So, in my research, I was, working a, I was working a lot with these different concepts applying the AI. And on both sides, this led to a lot of, lot of practical contribution. So when I always draw this full circle of these three fields, I was kind of interested if we can, if we can close the circle. Now when we understand a lot more about condensed matter and at the same time quantum development, quantum devices, excuse me, quantum devices are coming up left and right, and we are making huge progress in those fields. If we can borrow some condensed matter insights and bring it to the quantum computing and close the circle. And this is, uh, this is really new things that we are working on that I want to tell you a bit about today. The sort of 
two key figure of merits I would like to mention is on the quantum computing side, the concept of, your concept of entanglement. You all know how important and crucial research that is for us in a quantum computing to do anything useful. But you may be also aware that the entanglement can be a rather fragile resource that can, that can decay quickly or be, or be uh, vulnerable to the, to the noise and disorder in your system. On the other side, in really many body physics and condensed matter, the concept of topology has been playing increasingly important role over the last few years. And that has been a lot of work about using topology to stabilize, to stabilize different types of modes. So my talk today will be sort of on the interplay of these two concepts, specifically the use the sort of topological stabilization of classical modes and try to apply it to make entanglement less vulnerable. Specifically, it would boil down to answering the question whether we can use non-trivial topology to stabilize the quantum entanglement AI really making the connection between the between the topological progress in condensed matter and directly apply it to quantum computing chains. So this field of topology and condensed matter is a very, very broad one. And over the last couple of decades, there has been enormous progress describing all the different various phases of matter. Here are some examples that go from topological insulators to well semi-metal to topological superconductivity. There is really a sea of super exciting examples. One thing about this is that they are theoretically super exciting and there are even some proposal to use this specific topological states that would be native in some quantum condensed matter system for quantum computing purposes. But you may know that it's actually really tricky to observe these things. That is that it's always means a huge progress and huge step forward for us to observe any of these features in a real material. And every time some group succeeds in that, it's a huge deal. And that sort of that also links it back to this quantum computing application because even spotting these excitations that are in some sense topologically protected is pretty hard experimentally. To, so think about them in terms of really direct on-chip control is, is really, really tricky. So, but that doesn't mean that it's a less productive area of research. It just means that there is a lot of like a zoo of topological phases, but there is still a lot of challenges to really apply them for on a more computational side. The sort of separate avenue that has developed uh, recently, it was pioneered in 2016 by this paper, 2015 by this paper that I have all the way on the left, is that realization that a lot of these topological excitations, while they were natively observed or predicted in these complex condensed matter systems, oftentimes the topology of it is completely separated from the quantum mass. You can take classical mechanical system or electrical circuit, and if you couple the components in a smart way, you can create topologically entangled mode in a classical material. This has been a field that has developed, that is called classical topological metamaterials. And classical material people are very excited about this because you take a simple principles of topological protection that boil down to some invariant on a quantum state, then you figure out how to implement it classically. And then there is a range of application for developing new materials that will not kill immediately the mode you are trying to transmit. There is a specific example of this. And uh, this, is this, this is this pendula. This is a video from my former group at ETH Zurich by Roman Sustruk and Sebastian Huber, where they really mounted an array of pendula to the ceiling of the lab. Now we are looking at it like from the bottom. And they coupled them in such a way that if you push it, you get this chiral edge mode that is spin hole like and it's a, it, has a, it has a given directionality. 
and you need to and you basically you basically need to need to if you push it you excite only the edge mode and the excitation will not propagate to the bulk and the directionality of it, of, of it will be fixed based on which sublap is are you are you exciting and after that there was a lots of related work implementing similar things with uh, with uh, electrical circuits uh, 3d printed materials even building them from lego so really the the sort of idea of what i want to convey today is today is borrowing this idea of this classical topological modes that can be really engineered or implemented with like a really basic building blocks and bring them back to the quantum domain, to the engineered quantum devices where we have much more control about creating them rather than trying to observe them in some native material where it might be, where it might be experimentally very tricky. So this in itself is also not a new idea. There has been a lot of work where people are using, where people are using, for example, superconducting resonators or topological waveguides, where you just create some kind of lattice or array, and again, couple the constituents such that if you excite it the right way, the, the mode that appears will have some kind of topological, topological protection. There is, however, one really crucial point that made us interested in this question, and that's this. If I have some quantum Hamiltonian and then extract the topological properties, engineer them classically, and then bring that same idea to the quantum metamaterial, so I would have that same mode in a quantum domain, it's also important to understand that if I just do it like this, there is not going to be anything intrinsically quantum about it because it has to be an eigenstate of a non-interacting model if I can implement it with the pendula or 3D printed or, or something like that. So really interesting, re interesting related question that I'm going to come back later in the talk is that of can we actually then now when we have a really like a lot of tools to, to design these topological materials or topological modes more reliably, can we do something to really turn them inherently quantum? And that's really a core question of why we are interested in this. Let me take a, maybe a step back and explain, explain how, this, how this works on a simple model, which is like the 101 example of topology and condensed matter. And that's a Sushrifer hacker model. So basically you have a one-dimensional lattice. This was developed as a as a, just a model for the non-interacting electrons hopping on a lattice, where the lattice has a property that the hopping amplitudes are sk staggered. So, so basically your lattice is then, is then constituted from two sub-lattices, which would be the blue and green points that you see here on the figure. And then you have the in, in unit cell hopping, which is the V, and hopping between the unit cells, which is the W. Fun thing happens when you diagonalize this Hamiltonian as a function of your Vs and Ws. Based on what is their ratio, you will get a different sets of eigenstates. Specifically, when V is bigger than W, nothing much interesting is happen. But when you do it the other way, the W is bigger than V, specifically the extreme limit of that would be that V is really just zero and you only have the coupling that goes between the unit cells, suddenly you will get two modes that energetically appears in the middle of the gap and they are localized, spatially they are localized at the boundaries, boundaries of the system. Here you see a plot of the wave function amplitude as a function of the, of the position in the lattice. And these are manifestation of some non-trivial value of, your, of, of the topological invariant in that system. So if I, considered, if I just consider this model like this, you will probably believe me that I can reimagine this as a just Resonate, LC resonators that are coupled to each other capacitively, for example. And then I just need to be smart about 
because you know LC resonators they are just oscillators so you know same same and and then I just need to be smart about how I engineer this capacitive coupling to meet all this topological restriction and then what happens is that I will have those I will have those localized edge modes just as well. This was even experimentally done and observed uh, in the lab of our collaborators at FFL. So, but now we can come back to this question, question of this intrinsically quantum features, because I actually didn't do anything super deep. If I like put a super much effort actually engineering it in a superconducting resonators in a dilution fridge and really observing those edge modes. What those edge modes are, they are not so different than what the pendula I was telling you about before would have had. So the thought we had to sort of really explore this more quantumly was the most natural one in a quantum information and that's figuring out how to adding the entanglement into the system. And the scheme for adding the entanglement is the following. We just take two of those SSH chains, we couple them to a qubit, and then by measuring the qubit, we will entangle the SSH chains. I will explain this in a, in a little more details. So basically, you can just have a first SSH chain will be just a just the array of superconducting resonators capacitively coupled in a way that the topological modes actually arise. You couple it to the qubit and then you continue to your second SSH chain. Now your qubit can be transmon, it can be flaxonium, it can be quantum dot. If you like a hybrid system, that doesn't matter. You just really need a two level system. And then the way it works is that if you couple three things like this, you will get a you will get a Hamiltonian that you see here on the right. The first line is just the energy and hoppings in the first SSH chain. Second line, the same in the second SSH chain. Then you have energy of the qubit, and then you have the two coupling terms where the qubit is dispersively coupled to your first SSH chain and second SSH chain. What we do after that is that you basically need to figure out how to excite this whole system in a, in a state that contains those, those edge modes in those two resonator arrays. And after that, you can measure the qubit. And as a consequence of that, we found that you can project on a maximally entangled states of the topological modes. This is really not something super deep. You just know that if you have a three things, and you generate a quantum state that, that uh, who, whose probability distribution is distributed over the three things. If you measure one of them, there is a high chance that you collapse into the state of the remaining part that will have some quantum correlations in it. So that's what we did. And we indeed find that there is a state for which you get this kind of density matrix where you really get a maxim, maximum entanglement between these, between these elements that are in the corners. There is a lots and lots of numbers on those axes. And that's just because even if I am just talking about entangling one mode in one array, other mode in other array, in practice, there is an actually lots of different modes you can, you can excite. So there, that's why there is, a, there is a so many occupation basis state. So, okay, so this wasn't super, this wasn't super deep, right? Like I just tell you how to connect three things and go through some, go through some process to, to successfully entangle, successfully entangle two of them. So what we were interested in to see if the fact that we are entangling the two modes that are actually topologically protected could have some positive impact on the stability of that entanglement. So one of this sort of very standard entanglement measure is the sort of negativity. The, the formula is here. It has to do with the, I didn't write here all the detail, but basically you need to partially transpose your density matrix. And then you look at the eigenvalues that are, that are negative. And when we did that, we found a really, really fun, fun thing that I am now showing in this plot on the right. So, on the y-axis, you have a maximum negativity that we can find in that system. And on the x-axis, you have a parameter fluctuation. What we mean by parameter fluctuation is a disorder in V and W of your SSH chain. In the upper plot, 
we were always considering a systems that do contain the topological mode, i.e. the ones where the SSH chains are in the regime when the topological mode exists. And what we find for a maximum entanglement is that you see that all the way up to a really large disorder, where, here we, are, where we go all the way like up to 20%, the, the, the negativity stays at one half, which happens to be signature of a maximum bipartite, maximum bipartite entanglement. Each of these blue dots actually is averaged over 100 random Hamiltonians. So you always see, especially when you go to the bigger disorder, some spurious points. So of course, this claim is statistical and your protocol may fail. But on average, you are getting pretty reliable. I find this entanglement of the two topological modes and it stays entangled even if I have a disorder in my system. If we look at the orange points that are on the lower panel, you see a very different story. You start from the you start from the large negativity value, but the moment you add a little bit of the disorder, not only the negativity goes down, but more importantly, you see that in each column there is a big spread in values you can have. So this means that you are basically collapsing into like. A random state in a Hilbert space, which will have some, which will have some negativity, but uh, you cannot robustly predict like what kind of negativity and what kind of states you are going to find. So this was an exciting observation for us. Uh, but of course, we did this by just we can diagonalize everything, and we know all the density matrices. So it's not super hard. Well, it was hard and annoying for my PhD student because there is a lot of states, but you can just sort through them and identify these patterns. In experiment, you don't have that level of access. So we were, we were considering the question of one thing is that this maximally entanglement, a maximally entangled state that are protected that are protected by the property by the by the topology of the SSH chain exist. That second aspect is whether they are experimentally accessible. And there we run into an interesting challenge, and that's a degeneracy. So here on the on the right hand side, I am showing the plots of the spectrum that we get at the as the this at the one percent disorder. And basically and so the, so the most right plot is just a zoom on the middle part of the spectrum. And the two green triangles, they are the states. If I measure this state in a state one of the qubit, I am going to get a maximally entangled state. And if, if I measure the other state in the state down of the qubit, I get maximally entangled state. If I, me, if I do the same for the rest of the orange dots, I am just going to get some density matrix that can be maybe some multipartite entanglement, but it's not this clean bipartite maximal entangled state of this topological modes. So, but they are sitting as an approximately the same energy. So if I want to excite a specific state that gives me after the projection, the, the entangled state that I want, this is a challenge. One thing that we notice is that we can be strategic about actually engineering the disorder in those capacitive coupling. Because if you increase the disorder, here we go from disorder 1% to disorder 10%, your degeneracy actually decreases. So this process will be, at least to our knowledge at the moment, always statistical. But you can control to which degree you need to post-select uh, by controlling the disorder on your chip. That is one thing that is, that is kind of subtle and I hope it won't be confusing, but I really love this plot that Chin showed me, so I wanna, I wanna mention it. Uh, the, the really key thing what happens with the disorder is that the state you want does not stay at a specific energy. It will shift around a little bit. Because if you start tracking only a specific energy in your system, if you plot fidelity with respect to the state that you want, negativity and difference to the energy, you will see that there is some kind of crossover at a rather 
low parameter fluctuation value, where basically you go from, from this perfect straight line that is the same I was showing you at the previous plot, where it stays super stable no matter what you do, to getting the points spread all over the place. But it does not mean that your maximally entangled state disappeared or that it's not, no longer there. It just means that it shifted to another frequency. So you need to be, we need to be really a little bit careful formulating, formulating those, those post-selection rules and, and have a clear correspondence to which frequency you need to go at which disorder. I also wanted to show this plot because there is this really interesting behavior that it really looks like some like really crossover. You see it at the bottom plot at the energy line that suddenly the, the difference between the energy that you had for your maximally entangled state and the energy it shifts to with the disorder keeps uh, keeps changing changing rather rather dramatically so we think there is some there is some really interesting like a crossover behavior in the in the entanglement structure sorry for sorry for mm -hmm. interrupting we are we, we have to follow our schedule and mm -hmm. uh, if you and if you could conclude very quickly we would have time for a question we have a question here in, yeah here. So, sounds great i think i'm right on schedule i have last slide <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so that that brings me to the conclusion of my talk. The main message is that if you want to entangle on a quantum device, the states that can really pretty easily arise in an array of superconducting quantum resonators, instead of entangling just arbitrary state, the entanglement will be more stable and more long-lived with respect to the parameter fluctuations. So what we are working on now is to combine this into some interesting quantum network designs where we will have increased protection towards these common experimental towards this common experimental challenges and we are working with our experimental collaborators to actually turn this into the actual protocol to to tune the real life quantum devices again big thank you to chin who is a phd student who is leading this project in my group and the scarlino lab with uh, pasquale vincent and vera at ffl who are our experimental collaborators thanks for listening and sorry for going a little over time Okay, great. Thank you. No, you were perfectly on time. I was the one who started to get, be a bit uh, concerned. So thank you. Really, really nice talk. Um, we have one question in the Q&A uh, Q from Alan Santos. And, and the question is, in the system of superconducting resonators, have you considered interaction between the blue resonators? You had the, the figure somewhere at the beginning of your uh, first part of your talk. And then the continues, since we have parasitic couplings between the resonators of the system, I'm wondering if we consider them. Oh my God, this is a, this is a really good question. So I got to say that in our theoretical, theoretical analysis, it didn't come up because when they fabricated the first test samples at FFL, we could see those edge modes clearly and at the frequency where we would have expected it. So somehow for us, this sort of second order couplings weren't a big, big challenge, but, but I am totally sure this can be a consequence of a specific fab choices or something like that. So I think this is, this is a great suggestion. We can, we can quickly run sort of second order, second order coupling test. That's a, that's a great one. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, I think that if these couplings are weak, you will still have a very strong topological effect. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. Okay, there's another question from Andras Pai. Last one. Topological protection in the SSH model is due to chirosymmetry. How is chirosymmetry imposed in the resonator array? I, I think you answered this, but then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so what? Basically, again, because it seems like it has been it has been experimentally confirmed. You are the 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 like uh, base energy or the chemical potential. This you need to fix really. This you need to fix really carefully, and you can. And the disorder that we are considering is the disorder in the in the coupling between the the inter and intra sublattice coupling. And basically, those are the ones that do not break the, the, the chiral symmetry. So the source of disorder that is a big problem is the one that does not ha that happens not to break our not to break our topology. So in this in this sense, it should be it should be fine, I think. 
Okay, great. Thank you very much. And uh, I have to break off, close the session, and uh, we're going to uh, continue with uh, Jan Boda in the next uh, next talk. So see you, all of you there. Thank you, Aliska, once more for the great talk, and it was nice to see you again. Hope Thanks to so see much. you soon. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.